Hi, I'm Heather Marie Montilla, and you are watching PBS Books. PBS Books is pleased to partner with Poetry in America and the Association for the Study of African American Life and History for this evening's event. Thank you for joining us. Poetry in America draws students of all ages into conversations about poetry. Each half an hour episode offers the viewer a fully immersive experience in hearing, reading, and interpreting a single poem. Athletes, poets, politicians, musicians, architects, and more join together with host and Harvard professor Elisa New to experience and share the power of poetry. Let's watch a trailer. This poem literally makes me go back into my past. The first two lines, I mean, what kind of hook is that? When we put it in our heads, we're in the fastest roller coaster we've ever been on. If this was the only poem you had ever read, what would you think poems do? And what would you think poems are for? Poetry in America actually began airing on PBS stations across the country last week. So check your local listing. Also, you can go to pbs.org or poetryinamerica.org. This evening, we are discussing and delving into an amazing poem by Evie Shockley. You can say that again, Billy, which was inspired by a song by Billy Holiday. Shockley will be in conversation with historian Robin D.G. Kelly and actress Lisa Gay Hamilton to discuss racism, violence, and artistic tradition in the American South. But before we begin, we always like to thank our library partners, more than 1,800 strong across the country, as well as numerous PBS stations for sharing this important content with all of you. But most importantly, we'd like to thank you for joining us this evening. Thanks for being here. So now the moment you've been waiting for. It is my extraordinary pleasure to introduce poet Evie Shockley. Evie is a poet and scholar. Her most recent poetry collections, The New Black and Semi-Automatic, both won the Hurston Wright Legacy Award. The latter was also a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize and the LA Times Book Prize. She has received numerous additional awards and fellowships. Shockley, is a professor of English at Rutgers University. Welcome, Evie. Thanks. Thanks for being here. It is my pleasure to now also introduce uh, historian Robin D.G. Kelly. Robin is the Gary B. Nash Endowed Chair in U.S. History at UCLA. His books include Thelonious Monk, The Life and Times of an, Ori an American Original and Freedom Dreams, the Black Radical Imagination, mm -hmm. as well as many more and many articles. We're thrilled to have Robin with us today. Welcome, Robin. Thanks a lot. It's great to see you. Great to be with everyone. So glad to have you here. And to also join us for the conversation, I'm pleased to introduce Lisa Gay Hamilton. Lisa Gay Hamilton has had an illustrious film career, including roles at Astria, Vice, Beautiful Boy, True Crime, Beloved, Nine Lives, Honey Dipper, and more. On television, Hamilton ha can currently be, be seen on Hulu series, The Dropout. She also has notable credits for House of Cards, Chance, The First. She's also well known for her regular role on Emmy Award winning The Practice. In addition, she has acted on Broadway. And uh, in addition, uh, to the New York Shakespeare Theater Festival. She's earned an Obie Award as well as many others. Welcome, Lisa Gay. Thank you for having me. I'm honored to be here. Thrilled to have you. And last but certainly not least, it is my uh, honor to introduce Elisa New, who is the director and host of Poetry in America. She is also the director of the Center for the Public Humanities at Arizona State University, director of Verse Video Education and the Pal M. Cabot Professor of American Literature at Harvard University. She created Poetry in America, 
a PBS series with the goal of bringing poetry into everyone's living room. Uh, we are so thrilled to have Elisa. Welcome, Elisa. Hi, Heather. I'm thrilled to be here and so excited to be talking about Evie's wonderful poem tonight with well, your we're other so guests. Happy to have you. And before yeah, we yeah. jump into the content, I was just really hoping that you could talk a little bit about Poetry in America, how it began and where we are today. Well, Poetry in America is a multi-platform initiative that uh, endeavors to reach people in their classrooms, as we say, and in their living rooms uh, with poetry. Um, we uh, create a, we offer a PBS television series that as you uh, kindly said, has now just gone into its third season, but also courses for high school students and teachers and students of all ages, short courses, long courses, summer programs um, that allow people to explore themselves uh, as well as um, to explore the great discipline of poetry. And I'm really excited about this upcoming season of uh, episode four of which is Evie's poem. Well, I think what is so wonderful is you're able to craft these incredible conversations with people most of us know already, right? And, I, and, and what's so neat is then they're talking about a poem. Sometimes we've never heard of the poem. Maybe we've heard of the poet, but, but they bring it alive to us. And, and you do it, I, I think in half an hour, right? In half an hour, which is incredible. So we're so excited to be able to actually hear from um, our guests and from you. Um, just a reminder for all audience members out there, if you have a question, don't hesitate to put it in the chat. At the end of the conversation, we will be asking audience questions. So now my goal is to watch a clip from season three, episode four, which is, is the focus of, of tonight's conversation. And after that, you know, we look forward to the conversation that Elisa is going to lead. Have fun. Thank you. Blood tells the story. Do you salute old Gory? Were you born on a white horse or a black ass? Everything depends upon the way your rusty life flow writes. This is a bedroom story, right? This is a hidden story. This is a story that's not in the public domain, and it's the truth. One of the concerns of the poem was to draw a line from the antebellum period through the Jim Crow period and right up to the turn of the century. Blood tells the story. Do you salute old Gory? Old Gory is pretty slapstick, I'll have to say. So do you salute, now you're thinking of old Glory, but it's Gory. Right. So she's taking and twisting and presenting. And old, old Gory also referenced to old Glory, which is not the Confederate flag, but the Union flag. Mm -hmm. So we are implicating the North mm -hmm. as well. This isn't just a Southern story. Okay, that clip, um, I think, may begin to give the flavor of this extraordinary poem by Evie Shockley, which we'll ask Evie to read um, a little later in the program. Um, I, I'd like to open with a question to Evie that um, I think might need a little more context. And uh, so, hi Evie. So great to see you. Um, the, the, the context I would offer is, is this. Evie has written a poem um, that is uh, showcased in this episode of TV that somehow tells the story of everyone Black and everyone White in America. And, it, and it, it's a poem that fits on one page uh, and as Robin uh, Kelly said in the clip, it tells the truth. <laughs> the poem tells the truth. I would like to talk with you, Evie. You are both a poet and a scholar. Um, and as we'll see a little later, a singer, <laughs> a singer too. Um, 
how, what kind of truth can poetry give us and how, um, it, when, let, let me think about, I'm gonna give one teeny bit more framing. A poet takes the materials of history and spins them into something. An actor, we'll hear from Lisa Gay, an actor takes print on a page and has to turn it into something. Even an historian, as Robin knows well, um, has to take material and turn it into something. How, where does truth sit mm -hmm. in that? And I, I'd like to hear first from, from you as both poet and scholar. Oh, wow, what a great question. Um, I, I think in some ways as a poet, I sit between the historian and the actor in the, in the way I approach truth. I don't feel like it's my responsibility to set down facts in a poem. The truth for me would be the, the emotional truth, the social truth, the, the truth of, of an experience that, that I have, that I can relate through art to the way I hope many people um, have experienced this world. And if I can get to that feeling that taps into to how, how many people feel about the history that we live in, that's the, that, that's the truth that I want to get to. It's um, it's not about it's not about a linear story. It's not about um, sort of the 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 who, what, when, where, why. It's it's drawing connections between lots of different cultural moments, objects, um, figures that create a kind of a web of experience. Yeah, I, you, as you were talking, Evie, I thought about just the first line of your poem. You can say that again, Billy, the first, you know, the poem begins, Southern women serve strife. Now there are words there that refer <laughs> to things we, we, might, we, we might think are clear denotations and yet, once what and and that's an assertion southern women serve strife all the ways in which it is true <laughs> um it becomes the work of the poem um you to have help to in. yeah you have to leap in um just ground yourself <laughs> in a in a moment and I like that. I like the idea where that you've just offered that poets, you know, that 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 truth can be gained in a leap, right? That there's a risk on both sides, right? You have to participate in making that truth. I also really um, began to actually learn new things about you when you said you sit between the actor and the historian. And um, I wonder if we could have Lisa Gay and uh, Robin join us here, actor and historian. Ta-da, here they come. <laughs> um, and um, I forgive, I realized as I was asking this question that I asked you all this question when we, when we discussed this poem those many months ago, this question of truth. And you started it, Robin, because you said, it's the truth. <laughs> um, right. I, so let's hear about the historian's truth where you, you know, you, you, you neither you nor the poet just, you know, puts down the facts and the obvious you're, you have to craft and arrange and choose as well. Right. Well, I think, I think Evie said it perfectly, you know, that um, there's an emotional truth 
that cannot be captured, in fact, sometimes is um, erased or hidden behind facts or, or another term might be data, you know. Uh, and the idea that there's some kind of objective truth that somehow could be quantified um, is the very opposite of poetry. Poetry is, is, is Emery Cezaire talks about, is a kind of spattering. It's, um, it is a leap. It is a kind of uh, leap of language where even the words themselves are often inadequate. And so I take my lead. I mean, you know, I, Evie may sit between the historian and the, and, and the actress, but in the end, I follow the story. I, I follow the poet. You know, I always follow the poet to try to figure out, you know, how to understand, uh, you know, um, the, the struggles of, of humanity, you know. And Lisa Gay, Lisa Gay gives the most extraordinary readings. I mean, we, in, in poetry in America, one of, the, one of our conventions as it's developed is that we parcel out the poem among all of the readers in order, honestly, to, to make clear that these are communal um, readings in both interpretive readings and also performances. And we want everyone to embody but I have to say, Lisa, Lisa K is really better at it mm -hmm. than, than m most of us. And I'd like to hear about that, um, maybe about your encounter with this poem and ha had you, yes, how it, how it feels to embody and project through your voice um, someone else's text. It's the uh, most largest question I guess you can ask an actor. Um, words on the page are the most important thing. Um, I pull out my dictionary and immediately um, looking up those words and what do they mean? What's I think extraordinary about um, this program is that you spend that half hour with the poet and boy, oh boy, if I could hang out with Shakespeare for a little while, or I could hang out, you know, I used to hang out with August Wilson a little bit, but if I could hang out with that writer, what do they really mean? And so with Evie's explanation and everybody else's conversation about the poem, I really get the sense and really begin to understand the depth and the meaning of the poem. And as the artist, I can then take that knowledge, take my own emotional experience from reading the poem and do a reading of it. It made me think of all the different arts that could be combined with Evie's poem. It could actually be the Billie Holiday song uh, playing in the background, a dance company and someone reading it, an orchestra performance, um, having someone read it. There's so much musicality in the piece that it can morph into an, a, a, just an endless opportunity to give it all kinds of colors and shapes, both with the actor and with other artists. You, you said, um, let me, I'm gonna try this, a, try this a different way. You said, what a privilege to sit with the artist. <laughs> and here we have her. I wonder though, um, you know, it, I think Evie's, Evie's reference to that leap, which feels like a leap into the darkness, you know, poets go hauling language after them and sometimes or they seize on it and they're not even necessarily sure what they mean by it. And I have heard from poets that other people's interpretations can surprise them. And I'm, and I'm wondering, Evie, if any of the interpretations you heard in the in the show surprised you or felt, um, you know, surprised you on the upside, surprised you. Um, we said, what? How could that be? <laughs> Not in a bad way, but in a great way. Like um, I always feel like I learn what we are when I get the chance to hear about what other people have done with them. And that's the thing about making art with language. Um, it's, 
it's, you know, crafting and, and I've got thoughts and I want to try to um, create a scene, a mood, uh, bring in different ideas and thoughts. But ultimately, it's language and we all do what we do with the language. And so it was a huge pleasure for me to hear, um, you know, where Robin went with it, where Lisa Gay went with it and the other um, guests on the, on the episode. It was, it was um, fascinating to, to hear. I think someone mentioned um, Get Some Strange. which <gasps> made yeah, I was about to ask you about that. I've never heard that phrase before. So I'm going to offer some context here. Um, the the word strange, of course, is is the first word of the song we know of as as strange fruit. And that word, as we'll see in a few minutes, is embedded in um, in Evie's poem. And as a set of interpreters in the episode begin to talk about this word strange. Um, that, uh, let's see, strange, how strange brown vassal on a bed of green needles. Um, one of our interpreters um, says that there's a Southern expression uh, uh, used for having sex with someone to whom you are not married called getting some strange. <laughs> and that for me, I took my breath away. I, it opened up um, darker, <laughs> scarier, mm -hmm. um, also, you know, vernacular, um, you know, I don't know, pores in the poem that I hadn't heard before. It's one of those things that language is carrying so much baggage, so much history in it, that um, these kinds of associations, while I learned something and was surprised by it, I wasn't surprised to, to, to find that there was something like that in it. And I wouldn't be surprised if the subject of this poem and the, the kinds of um, very unwelcome um, sexual encounters that it contemplates weren't behind that phrase that I had never heard before, right? Wouldn't be surprised at all. Um, the language really carries the history. There's something more profound than I think I'm going to have the presence of mind to, to get my head around in what you've just said. That is that our language is itself a kind of archaeology mm -hmm. of our history. And that when a poet peels off a stratum and pats that into a poem, who knows what will, who knows what will come with it. I, there is a moment you were talking about disturbing or unwelcome sexual encounters, which is what this poem is about. It's about rape mm -hmm. um, uh, and all the, all forms of sexual appropriation, including that, um, as Robin points out in the episode that is imposed on on wet nurses or was imposed on on wet nurses there's there's a moment in the poem early where um you in a sort of jocular um the the jocular voice of the poet refers to fully armored knights that come clinking from the womb <laughs> oh, and those knights do you all, Robin? Um, there, there's so many. There's so many nights there that we might be thinking about. Which, and I'm not sure we talked about them in the episodes. So people watching this might hear something new. Right. So should I jump in on this? Um, please, so, please. So before before I answer that question, just one thing about the word strange. You know, the rich. You know, language is always moving. I mean, because text. So much of, of Evie's work is about drawing from texts and transforming those texts using puns, which of course is the highest form of humor, uh, but also devastating puns. But the original poem that A. Mirapol wrote was not called Strange Fruit, it's called Bitter Fruit. So Bitter Fruit becomes strange um, over time. And in fact, just like Lisa Gay was saying, 
the original uh, uh, poem was set to a choral, choral arrangement that Earl Robinson, the great uh, composer, did. So there's a, even before Billie Holiday gets it, it is actually put to music. Um, when we get to this uh, amazing line about femmes bear fully armored knights clinking from the womb, um, I immediately thought of Ida B. Wells and her critique of chivalry, you know, and chivalry serves as a kind of um, pedestal, right? But it's also a jail cell for, for white women in, in some respects. Um, and that is that every, every Southern white man is presumed to be, um, to have the armor, um, to be the knight in, in shining armor to protect the white womb mm -hmm. from, uh, from interracial sex, from consensual sex across the color line. And the, the, the cost of crossing that color line is death. It's devastating, you know? And so I saw all of that in terms of the preparation and reproduction of, this, of the violence of sub, Southern chivalry, you know, laid out from, from the moment of birth, you know, all the way up. Uh, with, through... with also, of course, the hint at the Knights of the Ku Klux Klan. Oh, exactly. <laughs> the, uh, I think of Connecticut Yankee and King, or, you know, Mark Twain seems to be, and we're, we're, not, we're not sure how much freight any of this, you know, and even as I am supposed to welcome new viewers in a second, but what we haven't yet said, although um, we've we've alluded to it, is that this poem is devastatingly witty. This poem is about the most terrible subject um, and the stain on American history, and it's really so clever and delightful. <laughs> it it and that's interesting. I am going to pause for one second and say that I'm Elisa New, the creator of Poetry in America, and that you are watching PBS Books. I'm here with Evie Shockley, Robin D.G. Kelly, and Lisa Gay Hamilton discussing Evie's poem, You Can Say That Again, Billy. Just a reminder, if you have any questions, you can put them in the chat, and we hope to ask uh, the audience for questions shortly. In order to set us up for the next uh, phase of this discussion, uh, I thought we'd show you another little, um, a, another piece of the episode. Let's run the clip. The poem uses the first two lines of Billie Holiday's Strange Fruit. I wanted to draw on the, the way that we um, emotionally attached to certain songs. And so I sing those lines because the poem speaks back to the song. Southern trees bear a strange fruit, blood on the leaves and blood at the root. You can say that again, Billy. Now, <laughs> now I would love to invite you to read the whole poem uh, sure. for us, Evie, and then we'll continue our discussion. Sure. You can say that again, Billy. Southern women serve strife. Keep lines of pride open. Trees are not taller than these broad vessels. Thems who bear fully armored knights clinking from the womb. But a knight in whining ardor means black woman compelled. How strange, brown vassal on a bed of green needles, ingest the fruit of Georgia, let that gestate. But B gets no child of the South. Blood tells the story. Do you salute old Gory? Were you born on a white horse or a black ass? Everything depends 
upon the way your rusty life flow writes. Sut penmanship. If it leaves blonde scribbled across your scalp, hooray, and blue inscribed in your eyes, praise the cross. Your literary blood wins the genie pool. It's a prize. Hide your mama. Baby, at worst, you're a bestseller. Compelling, Octoroon. But the bestsellers are dark and earthy, humid places where fears take root and grow up to be cowboys. Yeehaw. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Evie. And uh, in a moment, we'll have, oh, I think everybody's coming. I think everybody's coming back. Um, what a beautiful, uh, what a beautiful reading of the poem. What struck me, and I think I'm going to ask um, Lisa Gay and Robin to just jump right in. What struck me was how little difference in a way there was between your singing the lines and speaking the lines and the affinities between the poet and the singer um, and between poetry and sort of the, the elevated art of poetry and popular song. I was here, I was hearing that those, that um, compatibility or that kinship between these art forms very, very strongly. Mm -hmm. Robin, Lisa Gay, could you, I mean, let's, why, why don't we just um, analyze the beauty of Evie's reading? <laughs> Lisa Gay, you should go first. Oh, well, um, what I love more than once, it's so wonderful to hear you read it live given you are the poet and you are giving me the language in which I need to digest and keep up with you. So I, I, I love how you um, give the proper um, weight and humor and juxtapose against this very horrific yet extraordinary history that we all have been through. So I just, I just love, I love the poem, mm -hmm. but I also love how you read the poem and the words are so important that, and there's, there are puns and there's night and there's night and it's, it's just wonderful. <laughs> no, I, I, I concur in fact that your reading of the poem is worthy of Billie Holiday herself, mm. you know, because, you know, Billie Holiday um, was famous for phrasing. I mean, among many, many things, phrasing. And there's something about the way you take about 10 different stories, 10 different interventions mm -hmm. in this history, mm -hmm. and then cut them and paste them together mm -hmm. with pauses in between that allows us to see them all intertwine. They grow like roots out the ground and intertwine much like, you know, a magnolia tree, you know? Mm -hmm. And we, we can see it and feel it. And so it's very, now I, I really encourage people to watch the episode to get to buy all your books uh, <laughs> and to read the poem very carefully because just to see the way you use language, two words, compelling up the room or breast seller are so rich with um uh with image and story i i absolutely agree of course and was feeling um that that i it, i was feeling as i listened to the two of you um how this poem, more than many, really demands to be looked at on a page and listened to. It's, it's um, without looking at it, you will not guess the secret, <laughs> the amazing secret of the the way that the first line of Billie Holiday's Strange Fruit or of Abel Mirapol's Bitter Fruit 
is written down the left-hand margin of the page, nor, as Robin pointed out, will you see the way in which this poem looks like a kind of mysterious quilt of journalistic scraps mm -hmm. of history, of historical incidents rendered poetry with gaps somehow suturing them. Fragments, really. Please, yeah, I'd like to hear more about that. That's how we get our history so often, is in fragments um, that um, slip through the cracks sometimes. I feel we're, we're getting, um, I think what Robin called hidden histories. Um, and, and the poem, you know, I, I just really appreciate all the things that um, Robin and Lisa Gay have been saying. The poem really tries to um, bring together stories that are that are fragments of the one long, big, and often dark American story. Um, I was thinking about Ida B. Wells when I wrote this poem and how Strange Fruit as a song connects Ida B. Wells's work on uh, anti-lynching with uh, what she called the threadbare lie. I mean, men were being lynched purportedly because of the threat to white womanhood, but it was black women whose sexual violation was being, uh, was constant and, and unprosecutable, unrecognized in law. And so, you know, how do you, how do you suture all those fragments together? This poem was just, you know, one attempt to, to try to bring um, these various aspects of our history um, into one place that we can see on one single page. There, there are, I, I feel we should um, give our viewers a little more sense of all, what some more of these fragments are. I mean, William Faulkner is in this, <laughs> is in this poem you know, the plot of a whole novel, of one of his whole novels in a way, yeah. is yeah. in this poem. Yeah. Uh, Willie Nelson is, <laughs> is in Southern, you know, country music. Cowboys are in this poem. It's um, the, the Middle Passage is in this poem. It's, um, and how, the, and the poem, you use the word vessel in uh, and the, the poem is itself a kind of overloaded uh, and yet um, you know a, a, an uh, overloaded vessel that still doesn't contain all uh, that could be in it or maybe even all that I didn't know the Ida B. Wells um, and I didn't know that you'd had that in mind. Well I mean there's there's a lot there's a lot in the, the poem because it, it does connect so many um, moments um, before the Civil War, during, after, um, and um, all the way to the present. I mean, you know, this close to the anniversary of um, last year's insurrection, we have to all be still thinking about um, what kinds of forces um, are mobilized by that memory or nostalgia for um, a cause that that you know that caused so much pain for for so many, right? And William Faulkner was struggling with the aftermath of that in his novel. I thought it was a, a wonderful um, way to to bring him into this. I was reading Toni Morrison on Faulkner at the time I was writing this poem and, and to think about America through um, the lens of novels by two writers who were both so um, just virtuosic. Um, that, was, that was something else I wanted the poem to do, to just connect itself, like I said earlier, in a web to the songs, these these novels, these cultural 
icons um, and find a way to invite as many readers as possible to sit and think about this history and its impress on the present. You give Billie Holiday a special place in the, I mean, she's in the title. <laughs> you can say that again, Billy. And so she's in plain sight, <laughs> although we might not know um, which, you know, we might be asking which Billy, um, but only, uh, I wonder if many people, I bet there are some people who read the poem in a book, in your book, and don't notice that Strange Fruit is arrayed down. And what is that, what does that say to us about like the duration of reading a poem? You know, have we read it wrong if we missed that the first time? What do we gain by having missed it the first time? Because you surely knew that this was a little sneaky. I thought about um, italicizing those words to, to make them stand out. Um, but in the end, I decided against it. Um, I, I felt like it was what was important was that um, you could notice it. The title gave you a, a, a chance to notice it. And those words are so much a part of our culture that you know, like you said, sitting with the poem over time, it, it could surface. But, um, but ultimately, if the, if the song was a, a really good spine for the poem, it wouldn't matter if you went back to, um, uh, to the, if you, if you noticed the way the poem was using it. Maybe to mention Billie Holiday in connection with um, this kind of interracial sex would just conjure the song up on its own is one possibility. I also like to think that there's no wrong way to read the poem. I have to say that Lisa Gay's reading in the episode was one of my favorite, favorite parts. Um, you know, just that's the moment where you really get to see um, what what training can do for uh, how to deliver these lines. There are multiple interpretations that are possible. And, uh, and I, I like to write in a way that leaves room for interpretation. And Lisa Gay pointed out the live, um, you know, there's something different about live performance that we, we don't get, do we or don't we? Um, when we read, I'm just, I'm trying to think about the, the, where live performance sits in the reading of this poem rather than the hearing. And it, it's very wonderful the way you allow us to think about that, right? This poem, this poem, this, this poem is not just text on a, on a page. We hear it, right? We're, we're, and, and maybe we hear Billie Holiday, or maybe we are in danger of not hearing Billie Holiday. There's a, there's a story this poem tells too about artists forgotten, artists who are filed, um, who, are, who don't count, um, who don't have the respect that, you know, perhaps William Faulkner um, earned in his day. Robin, I as I recall from the episode and others will see you had thoughts on this. Right. No. Um, I was thinking also in terms of some of the language and how it narrates more than just what's in the spine. In, in other words, there are many kinds of strange fruits. And I thought about, for example, the question of, of, of class, race, and gender, and how, you know, when when you write Evie uh, about a knight in winding ardor means black women compelled, how strange brown vassal on a bed of green needles, which is about the normative nature of rape of black women that is just normative, and you lay that out, and then as you go on to talk about um, uh, sub. Uh, said penmanship in Thomas App, you know, um, 
Thomas Setpen in Absalom, Absalom and how it's about class on the one hand, where he is this striver growing up poor, wants to be fully Southern and ends up under uh, mining that af- attempt to become Southern because he ends up in a marriage with a mixed race woman and abandons his child. And then later in the poem, when you say, um, when you compare Billie Holiday's struggles with um, uh, Faulkner's success, you know, mm-hmm. and how it's tied to issues of race and privilege, despite the fact that we all could agree that he's a genius, you then <laughs> tie it all together with it's a prize, hide your mama, baby, which references, comes after the code of blood wins a gene pool, but then hide your mama, baby, references Charles Bon, the discovery later that, you know, his white son befriends the bl- black son and the white daughter falls in love with him. All these things that Faulkner does, it's like you do Faulkner and you do Billie Holiday <laughs> and, <laughs> together and then create this amazing uh, piece that is on a half a page, <laughs> you know? That, that's amazing. I mean, that's, that's, that's a feat right there. It's, it's genius. This poem, okay, uh, I have to admit that when I put together a season of poetry in America, there I've decided now there's got to be one poem we read for, and we're reading it for a lot of reasons, but one of them is for sheer virtuosity. It's for, this is a poet, you, uh, Evie, you're going to have to put up with this. Uh, this is a poet who knows her stuff and is operating at the, um, you know, at the peak of her powers and knows how to do wordplay and knows how to do internal rhyme and knows how to do illusion and isn't doing it to show off. It's clear, but the, the virtuosity is, um, ex- of this is extraordinary. And if you want to l- sort of see you know, what it is to see a poet on the flying trapeze, um, <laughs> you could read this one. And um, and and to tell a whole cultural history of of white America and Black America, Southern America and Northern um, America, that is um, that is really really something. If I could just add that, what Please. I also love about the poem is that there is the Black female perspective and the Black female experience. Um, and there is a gift in that that I think that Evie has given all women who are interested in history, but in particular Black women, the fact that Evie is a Black woman is important to me and is significant in the telling of her poem and the hearing her read the story. There's, there's just something I just thought of that just about what it is to be a woman um, through, the, through this history. And she gives you that, the good and the bad. Yeah. And to sound in the way Evie does. It's 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 the story she tells about women, but it's the badass way she sounds too, right? The vulnerable and uh, grieving, and but not missing anything, right? The um, the acuity, the count taking names, the right. There there is a historical chronicler here who is not going to let you forget that she is there, and the power of that. Of that, of that is um, is really something. Um, I'm to being told whenever there's a break in the chat, I that I should close. I am very sorry to do that. I think that's what um, I'm supposed to do now. Thank you all, Evie Shockley, Robin Kelly, Lisa Gay, um, Lisa Gay Hamilton for. Um, joining with me to make a television episode upcoming on um, on poetry in America. It will air in most cities in most cities across the country um, uh, three weeks from now. Heather, are you back to do questions or to say goodbye? So I think we've run out of time. Actually, I know we have run out of time. The conversation has been incredible, and I just want to. 
I'd like to also thank everyone, especially Evie, for um, your poetry, your creativity, your thoughtfulness, for the web that you've created and how concise um, you've been able to make it, but also how complex. Um, we were honored to have Robin Kelly and Lisa Gay Hamilton um, sharing your, your perspectives on race, musical tradition, um, also bringing to the importance of it to women. Um, and Elisa, thank you for guiding the conversation with your thought provoking questions. Um, I do want to echo what Elisa said, which is please tune in on your local PBS station uh, to the whole season, but especially to this episode. Uh, it, it will you will not be you will not be disappointed. <laughs> it will be thought provoking and it's fun, which is um, is so important. And and I think the thing I love about poetry in America is it's unexpected, you know, and the complexity of it. it it's just so wonderful. So thank you all for for being here and for joining. Um, I want to remind all PBS books viewers out there that tomorrow we partner with the American Indian Library Association to bring you children's um, trailblazer native author Cynthia Leitich Smith, uh, who will be in conversation with State Senator Mary Kanish Poden at 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Don't miss it. Uh, so, from PBS Books, it is my pleasure to say good night and happy reading. <laughs>